This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2020. Lesson 6 for August 1 to 7, ready for teaching on Sabbath August 8, Unlimited Possibilities, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, August 1. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you at the beginning of this lesson, at the beginning of this new month, and once again we know that we need the Holy Spirit to direct us. We need the Holy Spirit to be there with us at all times, and we need to be able to not only experience the presence of the Holy Spirit, but have your Holy Spirit guide us in the way that we should live, the way that we can bless others. And particularly as we open your word, may the Spirit guide and bless that we may see Jesus and know how to express him to those about us. Bless us, we pray, as we open your word this week. In Jesus' dear name, amen. Our memory text this week is 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Let's read that again, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. God calls us to witness for him, as we read in Acts 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And earlier in Isaiah 40 43 verse 10 You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Witnessing is not a special spiritual gift that only a select few possess. Witnessing is the divine calling of each Christian. The Bible uses different expressions to describe our calling before God. We are to be the light of the world, ambassadors for Christ, and a royal priesthood. Let's see where that came from. Matthew 5.14 You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20 Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. This same God who calls us to witness and for service equips us for the task. He imparts spiritual gifts to each believer. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies those whom he has called. Just as he gives salvation freely to all who believe, he gives his gifts to them freely as well. As we consecrate ourselves to God and dedicate our lives to his service, our possibilities to serve are endless. In Ministry of Healing, page 159, there's this quote, There is no limit to the usefulness of one who, putting self aside, makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. End of quote. In this week's lesson, we will study our unlimited possibilities for service through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Sunday, August 2. Differing Gifts, United in Service. Have you ever considered how different from each other the disciples were? Their backgrounds, personalities, temperaments and gifts varied greatly. But this was not a liability for the church. It was a strength. 
Matthew, a tax collector, was precise, exact, accurate. In contrast, Peter often spoke quickly and was enthusiastic and impulsive, but he also had natural leadership qualities. John was tender-hearted but outspoken. Andrew was a people person, extremely aware of his surroundings and sensitive to others. Thomas had the natural inclination to question, and he often doubted. Each of these disciples, though having different personalities and gifts, was powerfully used by God in witnessing for him. Question, read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, and verses 18 to 22. What do we discover in these verses about the need for people of different gifts in the body of Christ, the church? First of all, 1 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. And then beginning again in verse 18, But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. God delights in taking people of different backgrounds with different talents and abilities and imparting to them gifts for service. The body of Christ is not a homogeneous group of people who are all alike. It is not a country club with people of the same backgrounds who all think the same. It is a dynamic movement of people of different gifts, united in their love for Christ and for Scripture, and who are committed to sharing His love and truth with the world. Romans 12 verse 4 reads, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. And 1 Corinthians 12 verse 12, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. The members of the body of Christ have different gifts, but each one is valuable. Each one is critical to the healthy functioning of the body of Christ. Just as the eyes, ears and nose have different functions, but are necessary to the body, all gifts are necessary as well, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 21 and 22. If you carefully consider the human body, even the smallest parts have a crucial role. Consider your eyelashes. What if you did not have something as apparently insignificant as eyelashes? Dust particles would blur your vision, and the resulting consequences could potentially cause irreparable damage. In the same way, the member of the church who seems the most insignificant is an essential part of the body of Christ and has been gifted by the Holy Spirit. When we dedicate these gifts totally to God, each one of us can make an eternal difference. So to finish today, no matter how talented you might be, what are the things that you are not very good at, but that others in the church are? How should this help keep you in your proper place? Monday, August 3. God, the giver of all good gifts. According to 1 Corinthians 12, verses 11 and 18, Ephesians 4, verses 7 and 8, and James 1, 17, God is the originator of all gifts, and every perfect gift comes from Him. Let's read those texts. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one 
individually as he wills. And verse 18, But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And Ephesians 4, verses 7 and 8, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore he says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. And James 1, verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Thus, we can rest assured that He will impart to us the very gifts of the Holy Spirit that are best suited to our personalities, and He will best use our skills to serve His cause and glorify His name. Question, read Mark 13, verse 34, and 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. To whom does God give spiritual gifts? Mark 13, 34. It is like a man going to a far country, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. The Bible is clear. God has a special assignment for each one of us in sharing the gospel with others. In Jesus' parable of the householder who leaves his house to his servants and asks them to care for it, the master of the house gives his servants their appointed work, as we read previously in Mark 13, verse 34. There is an assignment for each individual, and God gives spiritual gifts to all to accomplish the divine task or ministry that they are called to. When we surrender our lives to Christ and through baptism become members of his body, the church, the Holy Spirit imparts gifts so that we can serve the body and witness to the world. In 1903, Ellen G. White wrote a letter to a certain man to encourage him to use the gifts God had given him in service. We read this in letter 260, written on December 2, 1903. We are all members of God's family, all in a greater or less degree entrusted with God-given talents, for the use of which we are held responsible. Whether our talent be great or small, we are to use it in God's service, and we are to recognize the right of everyone else to use the gifts entrusted to them. Never should we disparage the smallest physical, intellectual, or spiritual capital. Question. Read Acts 10, verses 36 to 38, Matthew 3, 16 to 18, and Acts 2, 38 to 42. What do these texts teach us about the promise of the Holy Spirit at baptism? First of all, Acts chapter 10, verses 36 to 38. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, that word you know, which was proclaimed through all Judea and began from Galilee unto the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him." And Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And Acts 2, beginning at verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about three thousand souls were added to them. 
And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Just as Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism to prepare and fully equip him for his ministry to the world, each one of us is promised the Holy Spirit at our baptism. God longs for us to have the positive assurance that he has fulfilled his word and imparted spiritual gifts to us to bless his church and the world. Tuesday, August 4. The Purpose of Spiritual Gifts Question. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 16. Why does God impart spiritual gifts to each believer? What are the purposes of those gifts? 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all and Ephesians four, eleven to 16 and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but, speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love." Spiritual gifts serve several purposes. God gives them to people so they can nurture and strengthen his church to accomplish his ministry. They are designed to develop a unified church ready to accomplish his mission in the world. The Bible writers give us examples of the spiritual gifts that God imparts to his church, such as ministering, serving, proclaiming, teaching, encouraging and giving. They also speak about the gifts of hospitality, mercy, helpfulness and cheerfulness, to mention only a few. For a more complete list, read Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Well, why don't we do that? Romans chapter 12 and let's start at verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For, as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy... Let us prophesy in proportion to our faith, or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches, in teaching. He who exhorts, in exhortation. He who gives, give liberally. He who leads, with diligence. He who shows mercy, with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honour, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. 
beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And First Corinthians chapter 12, and let's start at verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For, as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink from one into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, Much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, on these we bestow great uh, honour. And our unrepresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honour to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body. But that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or, if one member is honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts? And yet I show you a more excellent way. You may be wondering about the relationship between spiritual gifts and natural talents. Spiritual gifts are divinely imparted qualities that are given by the Holy Spirit to each believer to equip them for their special ministry in the church and service to the world. They also may include natural talents that are sanctified by the Holy Spirit and used in service for Christ. All natural talents are God-given, but not all are used in the service of Christ. In Christ Object Lessons, page 328, we read, The special gifts of the Spirit are not the only talents represented in the parable. It includes all gifts and endowments, whether original or acquired, natural or spiritual. All are to be employed in Christ's servants. In becoming his disciples, we surrender ourselves to him with all that we are and have. These gifts he returns to us purified and ennobled, to be used for his glory in blessing our fellow men. End of quote. 
Also, God has established such special gifts as the gift of prophecy and specific offices in the church, including pastors, elders and teachers, who are teachers within the body of Christ to nurture and equip each member for service, as we uh, read before in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Let's have a look there. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The function of all church leadership is to assist each member in discovering their spiritual gifts and teach them to use these gifts to build up the body of Christ. And so to finish today, what are some natural talents that you have that, however useful and beneficial in a secular environment, also can be a blessing to the church? Wednesday, August 5. Discovering Your Gifts Question. Compare 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 to 9, with 2 Corinthians 1, 20 to 22. What do these passages tell us about the promises of God, especially spiritual gifts, prior to the second coming of Christ? 1 Corinthians 1, Beginning at verse 4, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you came short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And 2 Corinthians 1, verses 20 to 22, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ, and has anointed us, is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts, as a guarantee. God promises his Spirit will manifest all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit just before the return of our Lord. His promises are sure. He has given us the witness of the Holy Spirit in our hearts to guide each of us to an understanding of the gifts he has given to us. It is God who gives the gifts, and God, through his Spirit, who reveals them to us. Question. Read Luke 11, verse 13, James 1, 5, and Matthew 7, verse 7. If we desire to discover the gifts that God has given to each one of us, what does he invite us to do? Luke 11, verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And James 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. We receive the gifts of the Spirit as we consecrate ourselves to God and ask Him to reveal to us the gifts He has given us. When our hearts are emptied of self-glory and our priority is to serve Jesus, His Spirit will impress us with the spiritual gifts He has for us. Ellen White writes in Christ's Object Lessons, page 327, Not until, through faith and prayer, the disciples had surrendered themselves fully for his working, was the outpouring of the Spirit received. Then, in a special sense, the goods of heaven were committed to the followers of Christ. The gifts are always ours in Christ, but their actual possession depends upon our reception of the Spirit of God. End of quote. 
Spiritual gifts, as we read yesterday in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 6, are qualities that God imparts so we can serve Him effectively. Let's look at those texts again. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. Ministries are the general areas we can express our gifts in, and activities are the specific events that allow us to use our gifts. Spiritual gifts do not come fully developed. As the Holy Spirit impresses you with some area of service, pray that He will lead you to a specific ministry to exercise your gift through an outreach activity. And so to finish the day, what are your specific gifts? And, more important, how can you improve those gifts for the Lord's service? Thursday, August 6. Growing Our Gifts Question. Read the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. What is the most significant thought that stands out to you in this story? Why were the first two servants commended by God and the last servant condemned? What does this parable tell us about the use of our talents? Particularly notice chapter 25, verse 29. Matthew 25, beginning at 14, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man travelling to a far country, who called his own servants, and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them, and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look! I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you had not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to every one who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away, and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And verse 29 once again, For to every one who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. The master gave to each servant talents according to their own ability, as it said in verse 15. Each individual received a different amount. One received five talents, another two, and another one. Each servant had a choice of how to invest or use the talents that were given. A crucial point here is that 
what they were given wasn't their own. It belonged to someone else who gave them charge over it. The concern of the master was not who had superior or who had inferior talents. It was not how many talents each was given. The concern was what each one did with what he had been given. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 12, For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, and not according to what one does not have. For God, what matters isn't so much what you have, but rather what you do with what you have. God commended the first two servants because they were faithful in using their talents. Their talents increased with use. The wicked servant did not use the talent the master had given him, and it did not increase. It is an eternal truth, as Ellen White writes in Christ Object Lesson, page 326, the law of service becomes the connecting link which binds us to God and to our fellow men. End of quote. The unfaithful servant squandered his opportunity to serve and ultimately lose the ability to serve. When we use the gifts that God has given us for the glory of His name, they will increase, expand and grow. How can you discover the gifts God has given you? Humbly ask God to reveal to you the areas He desires you to serve in for ministry. As He impresses you, get involved. Your gifts will grow as you use them and you will find satisfaction in His service. And so, to finish today... Think about this parable and apply it to your life. What, if anything, does it say about what you are doing with what you've been given by God? Uh, remember, anything that you have is a gift from God too. Friday, August 7. The current understanding of the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts brings unity to the church. The recognition that each one of us is valuable and a needed member of the body of Christ is a unifying thought. Every member of the church is necessary for the accomplishment of Christ's mission. Every member is gifted for service. From the book Testimonies for the Church, volume 2, page 282, I read, To every one there is given a work to do for the Master. To each of his servants are committed special gifts or talents. Unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. Every servant has some trust for which he is responsible, and the varied trusts are portioned to our varied capabilities. In dispensing his gifts, God has not dealt with partiality. He has distributed the talents according to the known powers of his servants, and he expects corresponding returns. End of quote. Remember also that the gifts of the Spirit are given for God's glory and not our own. God gave them to us to exalt His name and advance His cause. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Dwell more on the thought that each one of us has received gifts from God. What practical implications does this have for your local church? What difference can this thought make in the involvement of each member in service? 2. Share with the members of your local Sabbath school class how the gifts of another member have blessed you. Share with the class how you discovered your own spiritual gifts. What do you think your gifts are? And how are you using them to bless others? And three, this lesson pointed out that our gifts grow as we use them. Look back over your own life. Can you think of gifts God has given you that have expanded as you have used them to the glory of His name? At the same time, ask yourself again the question, first broached at the end of Thursday's study, about how faithful you are with what God has given you.
Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled He's Simply Carlos, and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. If J. Carlos Sanchez Ruiz was president of a Seventh day Adventist Union office in his native Peru, church members would courteously address him as Pastor President. But in Uruguay, where Carlos is president of the Uruguay Union of Church's mission, he is simply known as Carlos. Men call him Carlos, women call him Carlos, even small children call him Carlos. No one addresses him as president, no one uses the word pastor, he is just Carlos. Coming from Peru, a country where people are very conscientious about hierarchy, it took Carlos about a year to adjust to Uruguay when he first was elected president in 2011. Uruguay is a country unlike any other in South America, Carlos said. Even though Uruguayans recognize and respect leadership, they do not accept the hierarchical model. A leader is equal to everyone else. The Uruguayan mindset, which Carlos linked to a strong European influence, makes the country a promising mission field, church leaders said. The Adventist Church has only 7,358 members in the country of 3.5 million people, or one Adventist for every 470 people, one of the smallest ratios in South America. About half of Uruguay's population lives in the capital, Montevideo. How will we reach Montevideo and other cities around the world? Adventist Church President Ted N. C. Wilson asked pastors during a 2019 visit. Opening his Bible, he read Jeremiah 32:27, which says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? God responds to his own question in a powerful way, Wilson said. Then he turned to Jeremiah 33, and verse 3, and read, Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Claim this promise for Uruguay and for your work in the cities, Wilson said. You face challenges of secularism and materialism, very much like Europe, but nothing is too hard for the Lord. In an indication that nothing is too hard for the Lord, people are being baptised in Uruguay after attending programs at community centres or urban centres of influence operated by the church. Among the new members is a young man, Fernando Agura, who gave his heart to Jesus in 2019 after taking stress management courses at an urban centre of influence in Montevideo. Please pray for Uruguay and the other promising mission fields in secular societies around the world. And there's a photo here of Pastor J. Carlos Sanchez Ruiz, the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Union Mission, who's just known as Carlos. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.